What is vaccine dependency syndrome or COVID vaccine dependency syndrome? First thing you have to know is that this is a concept that I have created. And I've created it because I've been thinking about it for a very long time. Just a pattern of things that have been happening throughout the pandemic that don't quite seem to make sense. For those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. I focus on complex diseases, trying to resolve them, to find innovative ways of looking at them. And this is what I did with COVID-19, and it caused me to recognize viral-mediated autoimmunity as being central to the pathophysiology. Because of that paradigm, I'm able to look at the disease in a different way. And so many of the things that are happening now that don't seem to make sense, I'm able to try and analyze them. So what I'll be talking about today is some research that has come out of Denmark, where they were looking at hospital admissions with COVID and the outcomes comparing the fully vaccinated from the not vaccinated. Important to note, when they say not vaccinated, they are talking about people who haven't had a booster within six months. So it's not the never vaccinated. Very important differentiation. And one of the things I called out quite early was that they should have had information on that cohort, the never vaccinated. However, it still flags some important points. And it goes to one of the questions that people keep asking me. If they have taken the COVID vaccines and for whatever reason they have decided to stop doing it, are they still at risk? And this is the question that the Denmark paper was looking at. And this is where I think there are some concerning results that we all have to reflect on. So let's jump straight to what it is that they were looking at. So this paper was looking at the hospital and mortality burden of COVID-19 compared with influenza in Denmark. And it was a national observational cohort between 2022 and 2024. It was just published. So they started in May of 2022. You can see here, May 16th, 2022 to June 7th, 2024. So that's an important period of time. And that would have been in the Omicron wave. And so they were looking specifically at hospital admissions and whether or not they had COVID-19 or influenza. And this is what they are saying here. Admissions with COVID-19 or influenza, that is having a positive PCR test from either virus from 14 days before and up to two days after they were admitted into a hospital. And they were looking at the outcomes for these patients in that period of time. Now, this is very important because as I explained to people, COVID can oftentimes present as very mild and you don't recognize the significance of it until somebody is in hospital. And this is very important because they were looking especially at the older cohort, those who were over 65 years old. And here is what they were finding. When they looked at those results, they looked at 5,899,170 individuals. And they looked at how many had COVID admissions and how many had influenza admissions. And the number was about 24,400. And then they looked at what were the outcomes for these patients up to 30 days after they were discharged from hospital or after 30 days after they'd been identified. And they found here that the number of deaths were higher for patients with COVID-19 compared to patients who had influenza. That's a very first starting point, is that a lot of people think that COVID is just like another flu. Even though it's mild, it kills people more. This is not the same thing. As you are hearing, the CIA was saying that this is likely to be a lab made event that's their conclusion and it would fit with the way how this virus is behaving it is not behaving like something typical and so therefore i don't expect typical outcomes 
Additionally, what they found here is that among patients admitted in the winter, the risk of mortality from COVID-19 was higher than for influenza, as we said, particularly among those without COVID-19 and influenza vaccination, and also with comorbidities and who were male. So the bit that stands out to me is the fact that in reality, they are finding that if the people are not vaccinated, and as I said, remember I said, this is not never vaccinated. It just means that if they hadn't had a COVID vaccine within six months of that point, they were considered to be not vaccinated. So they become unvaccinated uh, straight away. Very important differentiation. And so you have to understand what that means. Now I'm going to show you the image comparing influenza to COVID here. And this is what it looks like. So when they looked here, this is in light blue. It's the hospital admissions. And num in gray, it's numbers of deaths within 30 days of hospital admission. And you can see here that this is for influenza. These were the admissions. And you can see a slight increase in deaths in both periods of time. That's fine. These are the winter periods. When you look at COVID-19, for one, you don't see that winter spike that you see with influenza. This is an all-year pattern. And you can see that all the way from June 2022, all the way up to March 2024, these are the peaks. And you can see down here in gray, these are the numbers of patients who died within 30 days of being admitted once they have had COVID-19. This is a completely different ball game, And this is why I said anyone who is underestimating this virus is not following the science here. This is a pretty serious virus. And you have to remember that in those numbers, and I want you to reflect carefully on this, and this is part of what I'm saying with regards to the inconvenient science. When you look at this and you look at the counts, Denmark is one of the highest vaccinated regions in Europe, maybe across the world. This is a lot of people getting COVID and getting admitted with COVID and dying within 30 days with COVID. I would say that this does raise the question as to whether or not the elephant in the room is as effective as they think. Call me a skeptic, they would say. But let's reflect on the facts again. So as I was saying, what we are seeing here is that, one, the people who are vaccinated are still getting COVID, still getting admitted, and still dying from COVID. And you know what's worse? They are not doing the autopsies. Because my question is simple. What is the mechanism? Because they haven't had severe COVID-19. These are not patients who are on intensive care because it would be very clear that that was the cause, the acute respiratory distress that could have happened um, with what happened in the first waves of COVID. They are still dying, but from a different mechanism. That's the problem. Nobody quite knows what that is, because we don't have autopsies. Why don't we have autopsies? Because people are afraid, probably, of what they're going to see. I've predicted from day one, this is autoimmune. They're going to see autoimmune characteristics in the organs, the heart, the kidneys, the liver, the brain. And that will raise whether or not this was caused by the combination of both things. Because my template when I think about this is that I don't reflect just on Denmark. I reflect on Papua New Guinea. It only had 5% COVID vaccination rates. The last I heard, they were fine. And so that indicates to me that unless they have some remarkable protection where they are not affected, this indicates that 
natural immunity is extremely effective. Call me simple-minded, but that's what it seems like to me. But here we have a cohort who are much highly vaccinated, still having COVID, still dying of COVID, and we don't know the mechanism because they are not dying of severe COVID. And if you remember, in April of 2023 was the first time I was speaking about the first case of a vaccinated autopsy death. The first one, full autopsy. That was the first time it was done. And since then, I search all the time. We're not getting autopsies. And so we don't know what the mechanism is that causes these patients to die. My extrapolation based on autoimmunity is that it is a vasculitis, inflammation of the blood vessels that then causes organ damage. And that's why it doesn't happen suddenly. And that's why it happens very subtly. That's my suspicion. But can I prove it without autopsies? No, that's the problem. Now, when they looked at this image here, this was looking again at the number of patients overall, what, 19,286 patients. The number of deaths was 1,700. So 8.8% of this cohort who were admitted died within 30 days of admission, not necessarily from severe COVID-19. And you can see when they compare the age groups, less than 65 versus greater than 65, let me make this bigger so you can see it. Um, what you then see is that it's very clear here, it's 2.4% of the less than 65s, but well, that's still significant numbers, and 12.1% of the over 65s. These are frightening statistics. This is almost 3.5 times higher in the over 65s. And again, if they had a comorbidity, it's almost double the risk, any comorbidity. This is the bit, again, that you have to think about. So they are looking at vaccination in the past 180 days. And remember, influenza doesn't really cause that much deaths based on the images that they were showing. If they were vaccinated against both, that's this cohort here, it's still 9.9% that were still dying within 30 days. It's 10% if they're only vaccinated against either, and if they were not vaccinated, but this was a smaller cohort, so when they did the adjusted um, risk ratio, it's highest in the not vaccinated within 180 days. You can see it here out to 1.36. But in all of these cohorts, this is a higher risk with regards to infection. Something is wrong here. I don't know how the scientific community can see this because these people are vaccinated. What are they dying of? Did they not have an effective COVID vaccine response? Why is it that after six months they have to continue to get recurrent booster injections? Something is not right. A final point I'll make to you here is something I'd seen all the way from late 2022, and I was trying to flag it then. I still have some more data to look at, but I'm not naturally a statistician, so I find it very difficult um, to look at that kind of statistical data, and it takes a lot of time, but it's still very important. And when I did the analysis on a period, a six-month window, when we had clear cohorts who weren't getting updated with their vaccine, there's a very strange pattern that was seen. And this is why I'm not surprised that those who were vaccinated are doing better than those who are not being vaccinated. I'm talking about the vaccinated cohort, those who are up to date. Take a look at this here. And this is my research. This is my work. So I can't claim that this is perfect. There may be errors in here. But this is what I was getting when I did the statistics. And it's looking at the age standardized mortality rate per 100,000 
person year. It's just a measure that's used. And what they found down here is that this is what they were boasting about. Those people who were ever vaccinated or third booster within 21 days had the lowest mortality. And this is non-COVID deaths, really important. I'm not talking about COVID, non-COVID deaths. This is the unvaccinated here. And the important point to note is you could see that from December 22, these two were coming together. So the unvaccinated were going to end up with the lowest risk over time. But when you looked at people who had two doses and beyond six months and one dose beyond 21 days, look at where these mortality lines are. For the unvaccinated, it's just about 1,000. For the first dose, we're up to about 1,700, 1,800. Um, um, so it's not quite double, but very significant. Um, this is 1.5 times higher for those who only had two doses. And so what it was indicating even from then is that when you stopped, whatever was working as protection here wore off within six months. That's pretty serious because we don't know exactly what was the mechanism of protection in the first place. Clearly, as we now understand, the antibody levels wane quite quickly. And I suspect this could be something to do with IgG4, meaning that it's more immunosuppressive. And so therefore it reduces inflammatory responses. And so therefore it appears to be protective. But what happens when the IgG4 levels wane? Do you have a rebound in inflammatory responses when people are then exposed again? Because what we're talking about here are reinfections, because these are not first infections that anybody had when we looked at the Denmark data. These are reinfections. And so therefore, what you can see is that in the context of these reinfections, you're having much worse outcomes than anything else. And there is one more image here in the paper, and you can see here that in terms of the cumulative mortality, the highest is this blue here in terms of COVID-19. It continues to circulate. And as I said, it seems to be primarily doing damage to the over 65s. We have a very serious problem here. And it seems as though public health doesn't seem worried. All they're saying is just keep up to date. They're not interested in the patterns. They don't want to understand why it is these patients are dying in the first place. Why is it? What is the mechanism? Where are the autopsies? There's a lot more work that needs to be done. But as I said, all the data is indicating that we have serious issues ahead of us because the virus continues to circulate and it's no longer following that pattern of just winter spread. I'll leave you with this image here. This is what COVID-19 looked like between 2022 up to 2024. We saw here it came down in the summer, but we know there was a huge surge again in June, July, August um, period across the world. This is not following the pattern of a seasonal infection. This is ongoing infection with ongoing mortality across the population, primarily, it seems, in the vaccinated cohort. We need answers. We need them soon. Let's hope that there is a change in direction in the next few weeks and the world can start to try and look objectively at these outcomes and try and find a way forward. But there does seem to be a COVID vaccine dependency syndrome. Difficult for people to get off the treadmill once they have got on. Have a great evening.